Let's talk about cross-examinations. Hey everyone, welcome to Legal Bites. If you're new here, my name is Alita. I'm a lawyer licensed in California and DC. And on this channel, we explain the law one bite at a time. So in this video, I wanna do just a really quick breakdown of what a cross-examination is, what are the goals of a cross-examination and who does them, all the kind of basics so that you can understand what exactly is going on when there's a cross-examination happening in a trial. So a cross-examination happens after a witness has been uh, examined on a direct examination. The direct examination happens when the usually the friendlier attorney calls that witness to help his or her case. And then a cross-examination is when the adverse party gets to ask those questions of that same witness. Now I say usually because sometimes you can have the more adverse party calling that witness because they kind of are forced to, but generally speaking, think of it in those terms, at least for understanding the basic concepts. So the goal of a cross-examination is basically to draw out whatever information you can from a particular witness that kind of pokes holes in their direct examination, the testimony that they were just able to give that sort of fills some sort of a narrative that helps the other side. And by poking holes, the attorney that is cross-examining the witness is going to want to pull out information that either shows their bias or shows their logical inconsistencies or that um, it admits that they have left out certain important pieces of information. And the way that an attorney does this is by asking leading questions. Now, if you have an understanding of a direct examination, you understand that on direct, you're not allowed to ask leading questions. And that's because you're supposed to give the witness all the space in the world to basically give their own narrative. If you do start to ask leading questions, you will draw objections from the other side. On the other hand, during a cross-examination, you kind of are basically supposed to ask leading questions for the most part. Now, a particularly skilled attorney can get away with not asking too many leading questions. They can use other methods like style and tempo and, you know, charismatic kind of elements to control a witness. However, for the most part, the easiest way to, to control the witness through a cross-examination is by asking the type of questions that will keep them from explaining too much. And that typically is going to be exactly leading questions. Now, if you aren't familiar with what a leading question is, it's basically a question that kind of supposes the answer. In other words, usually questions that are gonna end with a yes or a no response. Now you may have gotten this by now, but basically a cross-examination is really all about control. On cross-examination, a witness is usually gonna be a little bit stressed out and they might be kind of in defense mode. So any kind of opportunity that they can, they usually are going to want to try to explain, try to elaborate, try to sort of get their side of the story out despite the framing of the questions by the opposing attorney that may kind of seem a little bit unfair or just overall adverse. And because of that, the attorney that is actually doing the cross-examination is going to want to sort of narrow down the scope of their questions into questions that really don't have any kind of vague words that, uh, that will basically allow the witness to elaborate. As a rule of thumb, as you're watching a cross-examination, if you feel like the spotlight is really turning to the witness, that means that they are taking control of the cross-examination. On the other hand, if you feel like the spotlight is pretty much on the attorney, the jury has turned their attention almost exclusively to the attorney, then it's probably a relatively successful cross-examination. Now, that said, one of the biggest pitfalls for a cross-examination is when the attorney goes in trying to win on every single point. Now, the likelihood of winning a cross-examination is usually pretty low, and the likelihood of having a viral moment coming out of a cross-examination is also incredibly low. Typically, what the attorney is trying to do is just to pull out information, like I said, to draw out on bias, draw out on logical inconsistencies, omitted information that is perhaps relevant to the case, and basically to draw out those points so that they can then use it in the cross-exam, or not the cross-examination rather, but the closing arguments. And that's because at the end of the trial, the attorney or attorneys will basically put everything together into one single argument and say, remember when this witness was on the stand and they initially testified to this, but then on cross-examination, they, attest, they attested to X, Y, Z. And that actually really helps our case because of these reasons. 
Now, if you've been watching the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial, you may have noticed some critiques of various forms of cross-examination. And you may have noticed some attorneys getting noticeably frustrated during their cross-examination of a particular witness who has not relinquished control to them. And while I can definitely empathize with the frustrations of an attorney who is losing control of a witness and trying to somehow figure out how to regain that control, at the end of the day, it is up to that attorney to ask questions. Any witness who is testifying in court can't just testify out of nowhere. They have to testify in response to a particular question. So as the attorney on cross-examination, initially the power rests in their hands and it's up to them to craft their questions in such a way so that they don't relinquish that control. And really what that comes down to is breaking down bigger questions into much smaller questions so that they aren't vague and they really leave very little wiggle room. As an example, as a cross-examining attorney, someone could ask the witness if she had agreed to pay $500 for particular automobile mechanic services from a particular mechanic. And the witness might want to wriggle out of that and say, well, I agreed to pay for services, but not these particular services. But what the attorney can do in that kind of a situation is point to a written agreement and say, okay, well, you had an agreement with the auto mechanic, yes? Yes. And that agreement said that you were going to pay $500 for services. Yes. Yes. And you would agree that that agreement also said that those services would include tire replacement and tire rotations. Yes. Yes. And ma'am, you signed that agreement, didn't you? Yes. And then the attorney could turn to the services that were actually provided and say, well, ma'am, the auto mechanic in question actually did rotate your tires, didn't he? Yes. And that auto mechanic also changed the tires uh, around entirely on your car or something, right? Right. So basically all of that is intended to break down this agreement between the witness and the auto mechanic and whatever agreement that they had so that the witness is forced to either agree with the subparts that the attorney is asking her about or to essentially look entirely unreasonable in front of the jury by trying to wriggle out of questions that are pretty reasonably succinct. So what do you think? Do you have any questions on cross-examinations? Let us know in the comments down below. Also, linked to this video will be a video on the direct examination and the redirect examination. So if you haven't seen it already, be sure to check that out. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it informative. And if you did, I would love it if you could hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded. See you in the next video.